research and also how to use social media to augment your research is something that I think is pretty complex. It's pretty challenging. And even just doing research at the beginning can feel overwhelming, right? So it is something that I am very passionate about. I enjoy teaching others because when I look back at my own path back in college, when I first started doing research, it was arduous. It felt like pulling teeth. And it was over the years that I learned the different systems and was able to hone the craft and become a lot more streamlined and begin to enjoy the process and you know, increase my, uh, my output as well. So we care about it a lot and we're actually working on some pretty large resources and courses to help pre-meds and med students with research. Exciting news, the Med School Insiders Research course is now live in early access. So me and the team, we compiled our shared expertise. So I have 65 plus research items and it was a huge talking point in a very good way on my residency applications and interviews. And my colleagues also share their expertise in the course. And they're also very prolific and impressive researchers that give a different perspective and a different skill set. So it's a very well-rounded, really comprehensive course that we're really excited about. Now the course is specifically designed in the research approach and methodologies to help pre-meds and medical students bolster and strengthen their application. Because there is a different approach to how to strengthen your application for both medical school and for residency, versus if you want to become a PhD full-time researcher as your career. Two very different paths, and we discuss both and help you optimize for the pre-med and medical student that wants to have the most compelling application for med school and residency. If you're feeling intimidated and a little bit overwhelmed by research, fear not. I was definitely there, it's a very common feeling but this is an insanely comprehensive and well-organized course that's gonna make it a much easier stepwise progression for you. And we'll also show you how to be insanely prolific with a lot less effort than you think. The course is in early access, so the first four modules are available right now. You can purchase it at a heavily discounted rate, and as the future modules are released, you will get automatic access to them without having to upgrade or anything like that. You can also purchase the course later. It will be at a higher price, but we are giving a heavy discount to those early access supporters that wanna get access to the course right now, the first four modules before the rest of the course is finalized. Visit medschoolinsiders.com forward slash research course or visit the link in the description. I think you're gonna like it. But now perhaps the question on your mind is, look, I do research, do I really need social media? What's the purpose of social media in elevating my research? And the first most obvious answer is, of course, it expands your reach. And some might say, well, in terms of reach, I really just care about other researchers, other professionals. I want to have discussions with my colleagues. And, you know, if the public at large doesn't see it, not the end of the world. But again, I would counter that. By having a greater reach, you're actually gonna open up many more doors. And even if you want to reach more researchers, you need to have a greater reach even to the public. Now, here's an example. This was a paper published last month at the end of February in 2023 in Nature discussing the artificial sweetener erythritol and its potential link to adverse cardiac events. And within just the past few weeks, we've seen so many different YouTubers with large social media followings make videos citing this research and discussing their thoughts. So we have Dr. Mike Hansen, Motivational Doc, Thomas DeLauer, and you know these videos have hundreds of thousands of views on these channels that have millions of subscribers. And with this increased exposure, you're educating a lot of the public. You're actually helping advance the scientific community and getting people involved, maybe in adjacent or even different fields who otherwise wouldn't find your research. If I was primarily doing plastic surgery research, I wouldn't come across this study on erythritol unless it came through my feed on social media or some other uh, you know, content source that I regularly consume. Now, the important thing I want to emphasize here is if you have a greater reach to the public, then the algorithms on these various social media platforms will push it to more and more people. So then even those other researchers that maybe you want to target more effectively will much more likely come across it. Now, the next part is discussing how you can tailor your research, how you present your research rather for the social media platform that you're using. So YouTube is the best for long form video content, obviously. So you can be a little bit more deeper and you can discuss more complex topics, a little more nuanced, a little more thorough with the uh, platform of YouTube. Instagram, you can definitely do videos, um, but those videos tend to be shorter, although technically you can do IGTV. The way that most people are using it and how I would recommend that you leverage Instagram for your research is primarily through shorter videos that are highlighting maybe one specific point or through uh, photos or even photo carousels where you have various diagrams or figures to explain your research. Now you do have a description, a caption box underneath, but there is a character limit there. So you can't get too thorough with your explanation. You wanna keep it really to the point. You wanna get direct and provide value without getting too, you know, too wordy, too verbose with background information and, and all the other things that we would normally have in uh, our research communications. Twitter is of course 
best for discussing research with other researchers, with actual individuals. Twitter has been getting a bad rap lately, especially med Twitter, because it can be very polarizing and toxic, but in the research space, you can also have very powerful discussions meet amazing colleagues and, and it could definitely be a tool for good. For Facebook, you're mostly gonna be joining groups with researchers in similar areas, but Facebook probably isn't the most common or most widely leveraged tool when it comes to social media and research. And finally, LinkedIn. You can use LinkedIn kind of as a hybrid. You can post videos up there. You can uh, post longer pieces of text. You can have discussions with other colleagues, but um, the amount of traffic and activity on LinkedIn for that purpose is usually not gonna be as high as some of these other platforms. So it's gonna require a little bit more experimentation. I haven't seen LinkedIn used as much for this purpose, but it's definitely possible. And um, perhaps others have found more success there. There's a useful tool you should know about, which is called Altmetric. Think of it as similar to impact factor, but it's scoring an individual piece of research based on not only it being cited by other research papers, but just being discussed and linked to on blogs, on news sites, on social media, Wikipedia, online reference managers, et cetera, et cetera. And although it's really cool to see who's tweeting about your paper, what are they saying, things like that, there's two things to keep in mind. Number one, this is a very powerful way to get involved with these conversations where people are discussing your research. And then number two, you can actually use the information and the discussions here to see where you may want to explore and, and take your future research studies next. Another thing that people often don't consider is how you can actually leverage social media, not just for promoting the research you've already done, but even for conducting your research. You can use social media to collect survey data, and it's not gonna be the most, I mean, it depends on what you're collecting. It may not necessarily be the most accurate and, and robust data out there, but for certain studies, it's definitely appropriate. Now, here's an example of a study. This group of medical students at UNLV, they collected data using a Qualtrics survey posted publicly through both Instagram and YouTube community posts. And although the manuscript hasn't yet been published, they collected over 900 responses in just 24 hours. And I mean, compared to other data collection methods, that's a huge advantage. That saves you so much time, really accelerates the process. Now, if this is interesting to you, then there are three papers here that we don't have time to discuss further in detail, but you might find these interesting to read on your own time. One of them is using social media for health research. Number two is utility of social media and crowd intelligence data for pharmacovigilance. And number three is Twitter poll as a medium for questionnaire based health survey. Now, in addition to data collection, I wanna emphasize that the power of social media is so tremendous when it comes to networking and connecting with collaborators, other researchers, et cetera. I actually do know a group of YouTubers who got together, they did a, a research study and it got published and they all met through YouTube. I think some of them might not have ever even met in person. So now that we know that social media can benefit your research, how do we actually do that? How do we use it properly? One thing you'll notice is that a lot of very prominent researchers who are really pushing their, their respective fields, they don't have a large audience. Most researchers are not content creators, right? And that's unfortunate because a lot of content creators who have sizable audiences, who don't have any scientific background, who have never done research, et cetera, et cetera, they're the ones who are making content, providing information to the public. And sometimes it's not correct. And that can be to great detriment. And as educators, I do believe that it's at least somewhat our responsibility to help cut through the noise and help educate the public in the most effective way possible. So this primarily comes down to two things. Number one is the packaging and number two is the entertainment. So first is packaging. Most researchers are very well versed in a topic. They speak a lot of jargon. They can really go into the weeds about a specific topic because they're usually discussing it with other experts in the field. But if you try this on social media, it's not gonna work well because you will lose just about everyone. People won't understand what you're talking about. They won't, they don't even know what the jargon means and it's just not as engaging for them. So what you need to do is find a way to, if you are going to use jargon, first define it. So really dumb it down to the foundational concepts and get everyone on board so that everyone's starting from the same, okay, cool. We know what we're talking about. Let's proceed one step at a time. But at the same time, you need to also speak to the nuance, speak to the details that the experts would find engaging. Now, this is a challenging thing to do, but it is absolutely possible and we'll show you some examples. Now on to entertainment. If you present your research in the same way on social media as you would at a research conference and you go through you know, your institutional affiliations, disclosures, et cetera, and you're getting really 
cut and dry about it, you're gonna lose people on social media. You're not gonna engage. You're not gonna actually have a significant viewership based on that approach. We wanna dive straight into the details, the value, the actual concepts that people wanna hear about. And what can really help is engaging them with a hook, with a question at the beginning that you will answer, that your research will help answer over the course of the video. But this hook is gonna keep people watching a lot longer than they otherwise would. Another part of how engaging and effective that content is gonna be, how widely it'll be viewed, comes down simply to aesthetics. So it depends on the platform, obviously. Something like Twitter, the aesthetics don't really matter so much. But on something like Instagram or YouTube, then it definitely matters a lot. On YouTube, you have thumbnails. No one, you can have the best video in the world, but with a bad thumbnail, no one's gonna click on it, no one's gonna watch it, right? And on Instagram, the content itself is visual primarily, and the text is almost like a second thought. Now, maybe five or 10 years ago, it would have been fine to just do a Zoom presentation, you know, record a PowerPoint and post it on YouTube, and it could do okay, right? But now, because it's getting more saturated, it's getting more and more competitive, everyone is elevating their game, it's not gonna cut it anymore. Now, you don't need some expensive YouTube studio setup by any means, but you want to be intentional with your setup. We all have smartphones. You can frame, you can use your smartphone and frame the actual composition appropriately. You can use natural light. You can get good audio. And these little things will add up to make a much more pleasing and engaging piece of content. And every little bit actually helps because the way the algorithm works is slight changes with the average view duration or the average click-through rate from the audience will tell the algorithm how much to push it. So if you have a high retention and a good click-through rate, the algorithm is much more likely to push and promote your content. And it's gonna reach, it's just gonna snowball and reach more and more people. So dialing in these little details, this little polish can do a lot for the overall performance of a video. And I can give you an example. The first ever YouTube video we created on Med School Insiders was lower production quality. I was writing on a piece of paper and that video has about 700,000 views roughly. We created the exact same video, maybe two years later, so it doesn't have as much time on YouTube, but it's the exact same content verbatim, the same exact script, except we used animations, we made it a little bit more visually engaging, and now it has close to 4 million views. So since the content is the same, it really just comes down to that polish, that professionalism, that entertainment value, which is why the second video did so much better than the first. Now, if you don't have video production or editing skills, don't worry, you can always, first of all, hire someone, which is the easiest option, or number two, if you have the time and you're self-motivated, you can learn yourself. Most content creators are self-taught and it's not nearly as challenging as it looks. So regardless, if you want to improve your reach on social media and impact more people, you have to be very intentional. Don't approach it in the same way that you would approach a research conference or an oral presentation. Make it engaging for all viewers, those who are completely new to the topic, as well as those who are also your colleagues and other experts in the field. But that's just the first step of the puzzle, the foundation. The next question is how do we actually increase our reach? All right, so there are a few different methods on how to do this. And to illustrate that, we're gonna show you some examples. First up is Dr. Inigo Sanmalan. He is a professor at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and he does his clinical research in cellular metabolism, diabetes, cardiometabolic disease, and cancer. And I actually found him through his podcast on both Peter Atia's The Drive, as well as Global Cycling Network, GCN, on YouTube, where he discusses zone two training. Now, what's happening here is he's the world expert on a very specific niche that's relevant to those interested in longevity medicine, such as Dr. Peter Atia, as well as uh, cycling fitness and just overall you know, athletic uh, performance like GCN, Global Cycling Network. So he is leveraging these other content creators, these other people who have large audiences and is providing his expertise, a discussion with them to reach far more people than he could ever alone by just creating content about zone two training, zone two training, zone two training, day in and day out. Now, one of the reasons that he's called back and you see him on all these different shows and he, he's on GCN multiple times and he's, he's doing the rounds, he does such an amazing job of taking something that's very complex and dumbing it down. At the beginning of any podcast, they go through the foundations of, okay, what is zone two? What is the definition? Because there are different definitions of zone two, of different zones of uh, you know cardiovascular training. So they go through that and they progressively get more and more advanced, but you're not using some crazy, crazy jargon that a lay person wouldn't understand. Or if you are gonna use jargon, then you first define it. Next up is Dr. Andrew Huberman, a favorite of many, including my own. He is a professor of ophthalmology and neuroscience at Stanford. And he has a very popular uh, podcast called Huberman Lab. He has 2.7 million subscribers on YouTube. 
3 million followers on Instagram. He actually leveraged exposure from being a guest on podcasts like Tim Ferriss, Joe Rogan, and others to jumpstart his following. By first being a guest and being exposed to those millions of followers and viewers, he could then leverage that, capture that interest, and then when he started his own, he had a jumpstart. One website I wanna share with you is called ResearchGate. And it's a great way to keep tabs and get updated on what your colleagues are working on. Here is Dr. Huberman's profile. You can see PhD, Stanford, and there's some statistics they have, some, some numbers in case you're, you're into that. But scrolling down, you can actually see all of his various publications, and you can even ask questions and um, have discussions, although that is not as commonly used. And again, I do feel like if you wanna have um, meaningful conversation and discourse about research, then those other platforms are gonna be better. But there's a section for questions and, and things like that too. All right, final point. One of the great things about social media is that if you're intelligent with your approach, you can actually have the different platforms feed into each other. So if you have a large and growing YouTube presence, you can start repurposing content and start putting that on Instagram and TikTok and other places. And you may need to tweak them. You know, you take that content, you can't just repost it. You have to tweak it, you have to cut it up. You need to change visuals, you need to, et cetera, change the aspect ratio. Uh, and the length and, and all these things. By doing that, you are building an audience on another platform and they can cross pollinate. It's a really powerful tool, a way to get your work in front of more eyeballs. All right, so in summary, social media can be a powerful tool for researchers to help expand their reach and also meet other researchers and colleagues in the field. You can also leverage various tools such as Altmetric to assess reach, gauge public interest, and potentially guide future projects. Social media can also be used to actually conduct data collection. Now, as for growing an audience on social media, so you can get your research in front of as many eyeballs as possible, consider how are you packaging and presenting your research? You wanna make sure that it's uh, simplified enough and you're speaking to the layperson, but also at sufficient depth to keep the more knowledgeable viewers engaged too. Make it aesthetically pleasing and tailor the content based on the platform you're using. Leverage opportunities to get in front of other people's audiences when you are serving as the content expert. And by using these tips, I am confident that you'll be able to leverage social media as a benefit and as a tool for your research. Thank you all so much for watching. If you wanna get in contact, you can message me on at KevinJabalMD on Instagram or KevinJabal.com.